Yeah, I've been working as a journalist for the AP for about 12 years, and my last job was as the bureau chief in Korea. So there I was mostly covering things like, like the North Korea nuclear weapons issue, which still drags on for years and years and has not been resolved. Uh, you know, I, I traveled to uh, Afghanistan after September 11th and covered some of the fighting there. I was in Iraq as an embedded reporter during the war in 2003. I covered, uh, basically every stand country in the world. I was based in Uzbekistan for two years covering Central Asia after September 11th and uh, yeah, covered kind of this whole region and, and Pakistan during earthquakes, Afghanistan many times beyond uh, beyond that, and uh, you know, it was kind of doing like the regular journalism work that we would do at the AP. And you know, journalism obviously over this time is, is being increasingly disrupted by, by new forms of media. And I'd always been kind of interested in, in technology. I was a fuzzy during my time at Stanford. I was not a techie. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, and I worked at the Stanford Daily, which I heard got some mention here earlier today. <laughs> Context, I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to quiz um, later to figure out what that is. Anyway, so so yeah, I, you know, obviously journalism was kind of going through this upheaval, and I, and I had the amazing chance to come back to Stanford and do the Knight Fellowship to like do kind of this sort of stuff, like what you're doing, taking classes at the D School, at the GSB, in the Computer Science Department, in the Comm Department, to like look at what's going on and figure out, you know, what we could do about it. It's kind of funny, actually one of the things that kind of led me to really think about doing something more with social media was the fact that I've been sitting in all these classrooms with all these young undergrads and everybody now has laptops, obviously, and Wi-Fi and everything, and what are you all looking at all the time was like Facebook back then. Maybe that's changed, like in five years, Facebook is not maybe as high as it once was, but everybody during every class is looking at Facebook. And here I am coming back from like risking my life as a reporter in all these crazy <laughs> countries. Like, why am I doing that? What is it all for? If people are just going to care about like their friends' like party photos and, and like what they're drinking and stuff. So I was like, well, how can we make like this serious news as interesting as Facebook, so that people would actually want to like look at it, like they look at their Facebook pages all the time. So that that was kind of just like thinking about you know where kind of the the seeds of the idea. It's also, while I was here, kind of, it was a time when Twitter was really starting to emerge as a source of news. So actually during that year, uh, I was on the fellowship from 2008 to 2009, there was this like photo of this plane landing in the Hudson River, if you all remember that kind of like landmark, you know, tweet photo, it was like the first time that, that people kind of realized what an amazing source of news social media could be. Even though it's in New York, you know, the media capita, capital of the world, with all these journalists all sitting there, like a photo from somebody's smartphone was the best photo of that of that incident. So, you know, kind of all these ideas were like stirring around in, in my head, and uh, you know, off I went <coughs> aimlessly to uh, figure out what I was doing during this fellowship. And uh, I went back kind of briefly to work following the, the year of the fellowship, but somehow being at Stanford. You know, makes you want to do a startup, right? I don't know why that is. Like, and, and just you know, you know, it's, it's like in the air here. We'll talk about it every GSP class. They're like, if you aren't going to do a startup, who will? Like, you who have all these opportunities and and could kind of follow your passion and do something. So, you know, I guess I caught the uh, the bug and decided I should try to do a startup because when else, you know, would I have a chance having come off of these amazing you know connections, and having a year back at Stanford, which is really been quite a lucky fortunate thing to have. So so I came back here not really knowing what I was going to do, actually, and uh, set off to try to find, find a co-founder. So as part of that, it's kind of interesting, I, uh, so I also started this meetup group, partially because I thought it was something needed, but also because I, I needed to find a co-founder, and the group is called Hacks and Hackers, which mention that yes yeah yeah so I, I started this group and really I was thinking like how do we bring together the hacks the journalists and the hackers to talk about you know where the future of media is going and I mean obviously that that idea is nothing that is you know I mean back then maybe it was a little more original now I mean obviously the fact that you have this class is kind of emblematic of, of why that needs to happen and, uh, and what that is so I started this meetup group and just started trying to you know, find people who kind of were interested in this intersection of technology 
and media and talking about it and what we could do together and put on a hackathon and try to see like if I could meet people. And meanwhile, I also was like going to every possible meetup I could to find uh, a potential co-founder, like somebody to work with. Um, I guess I was not lucky enough. I don't think this class existed at that time. I could find potential co-founders right here while at Stanford. So, I mean, you, you really have a great opportunity here to potentially find people who you might work with if you know you want to take your ideas further, given that you know you're already here getting a chance to work together to try that out. So, so yeah, I ended up kind of going through this process, trying to go to every event I could, and uh, eventually was able to find find a co-founder who I ended up starting Sorify with. It turns out it was a guy from Belgium, like no connection to the Bay Area necessarily, but he had moved here because this is where you come if you want to do a startup, right? So, so we kind of talked, and it, it's it's funny. Like the first time I met him, I asked him what what do you really want to do? Like what's your big vision? And his answer was, I want to kill the AP. <laughs> just worked for 12 years. So. And I, I told him that, and he said, oh, okay, sorry, offend you, but, but I, was, I said, no, that's fine, like, it's not that I, I'm not trying to kill them, but, you know, I understand what you're getting at, and, and like, clearly media is being disrupted, and, you know, that kind of led to us sort of having our little, like, dating phase, we worked on ideas, and kind of proved things to each other, and I think it, it is kind of interesting, like, this, this tension between, like, the journalism world and technology world, and how people work together. Um, you know, like, at Stanford, you always talk about all this stuff, like, you know, fail fast, and try things, and don't worry about it. I mean, that, that kind of ethos is really core to, like, Silicon Valley, and design, and computer science, and don't worry about, you know, some bugs, we'll fix them later. Whereas in journalism, I mean, what I had ingrained for me for 12 years was, do not make a single mistake, because you could be fired if you screw something up, right? I mean, I'm at the AP, if I file, you know, we were kind of tweeting before tweets exist. We would send these, you know, news alerts that would beep and go off in every single major newsroom all around the world when there was an urgent news event happening. So I couldn't, like, you know, say, oh, North Korea tests nuclear weapon. I send it out. I mean, within, like, seconds, that's alerting everybody in the world. CNN will cut into breaking news, whatever. Like, I can't, oops, sorry, take that back. Uh, <laughs> like, I need to fix that now. Like, no, you, you kind of can't do that in the news industry, obviously. Like, you have a lot of systems in place, hopefully, where you have, you know, people, editors checking things, you're confirming things, you kind of have standard practices for doing this. So, I mean, I guess I, I always kind of feel this tension sometimes in, in the worlds of journalism and, and technology, and how do you balance these two impulses? And, and it really, you know, it, it's taken me a while to kind of learn to go with that and like not worry about things being <coughs> perfect because they don't need to be. At the same time, I mean, there are some cases where you do want things to work reliably. And, and sometimes I almost think like there's some almost too much hype around, uh, you know, the minimum viable product and all these things that people talk about. Oh, just put something out there and see if it works. Like, well, if, if your product is failing, if you're storified, if you try to write something and it just deletes everything you do every time you try to do something, that's not very useful, right? The people aren't going to want to come back and keep writing, you know, an article if every time they do it, they delete it. So I, I guess I, I try to, you know, I think of ways we can kind of maybe all get along and, and think about these competing impulses and actually, you know, build something greater together. And I do think there is a lot like that that media and technology have in common. And, uh, and that, that is a lot around the mission and vision of what you kind of want to do. Like for me, I mean, I've always really been motivated more by, you know, something that can make a difference, that gets attention of the audience, and it changes, you know, people's minds, you know, you write, write about something hoping that, you know, it'll have an impact in some way, that it'll change what people think about something, you'll find a story that nobody else, you know, has uncovered before. Like that's, that's really when you're kind of doing the best journalism work, is like breaking it important scoop or going somewhere that no journalist has ever been to to, to make people aware of a problem. And uh, I, mean, I think that impact mindset is really core to like true technologists. You want to you know, create something that really does change the world like people talk about. That you know is a new system of doing things. Maybe it's open source even. So it really is like this altruistic thing that you're just kind of helping make you know, a better foundation for the people who come after you by, by doing things in a new and innovative way. And I, and I really think, you know, writing in some ways also is, is kind of core to both 
technology and journalism. It's really interesting to me to see a lot of great programmers who are also great writers in English, not just in machine languages, right? I mean, there is sort of a craft that goes with this. It is artistry, and I think you know we should like appreciate each other for what that is. So anyway, so I met, going back to the story, so I met my co-founder, uh, Xavier, and we were kind of working on some different ideas about what to do together to bring these worlds, you know, social media, journalism, what does that mean, what should we do? And he had kind of had this other idea, I had some other ideas. We ended up building this thing initially where you could uh, embed a tweet on a page. And that was like a very basic thing that we were sort of testing, like, do people care about that? Do people want to do that? And it turned out, yeah, people do want to do that. Okay, that's interesting. We keep see seeing people taking screenshots and like putting them in their articles. Okay, so there is some value here to like using social media, you know, not just to like share links to the world, but actually to like pull in information, like if a plane lands in the Hudson and there's a photo of it. So that, that's really what became the foundation for Storify, which, uh, which we launched in September of 2010 in a private beta. We hadn't raised any money, it was just us two working together for like quite a few months. I mean, I was, uh, you know, as a non-technical co-founder, you do everything except write code, but I was, you know, talking to users, like, bouncing ideas off of them for interfaces, finding a design firm which helped us do the initial design for things, you know, I was the tester testing the initial versions of the code, trying to find potential investors as we were building this out. So we launched this and, uh, you know, it was still the two of us. We started getting some more people to use it, basically by me kind of begging people to use it using media connections and people I knew, partially because I had this hacks and hackers network of people to go to. And uh, we ended up raising raising a, an investment from a VC from uh, Coastal Ventures to uh, to go kind of further with it a few months after launch. So that was uh, like the end of 2010. I'm not gonna go through like all four years, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, just, so we, we raised money and we started hiring more of a team and, uh, and building up an engineering team. I don't know, I, in some ways I feel like we raised too much money too soon and I, I think sometimes like in the valley like people <coughs> fetishize raising money like oh look at this company they raised all this money isn't that great like I actually think I mean wouldn't it be more impressive if somebody created a giant company without raising any money right and doing it all on their own I mean I think to some extent like we should not I wish we had tested more, you know, business models early on. I wish we were forced to. I wish it like almost wasn't so easy to raise money. Not that it was easy, but I think there's a lot to be said for like trying to do things on your own as much as possible. Like it'll help you be more successful in the long term. So that's just kind of something I would throw out there. I mean, it's something that I, that I definitely think I would do differently in the future. So because I mean, once you raise a lot of money, you start you know, maybe wasting money, you hire people, they don't work out, you, you're just not as careful with things, you've got to get an office, then we got to get like free lunch, then we got to get, you know, cool stuff on the walls, then we... <laughs> I mean, it can get kind of crazy, so I really think like that, that's not what makes the company successful, what really makes the company successful is do you have this product that people really want to use, and also a lot of this team stuff that you guys are talking about today, like do you actually work together and not want to like kill each other all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, to, to me, some of the more, I mean, the successes that I see with, with some of these big technology companies, it's not even so much like the products they create, it's simply having a culture that's, that's grown and, and works at such a high scale. That, that's amazing to me. I mean, at Storify, we, uh, we never had more than 10 people, actually. We were a very small company. But, you know, with the, with the small company, we were able to make like a, a reasonable impact. I mean, just and not to like do a pitch for Storify or anything, but I'll just quickly like show, in case you haven't seen it, like what it is. Um, so I mentioned this idea of storytelling using social media. So basically, Storify is like a blogging tool that lets you pull in social media, you know, tweets, Instagram photos, YouTube videos, all sorts of elements to tell a story. I don't know how many of you saw this thing that the New York police did like this week. <coughs> Right, they, hey, tell us your great stories about New York NYPD and why you love us. And then people started posting, you know, all these you know, photos from Occupy. And, yeah, this is how they engage with their community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, I mean, so, and it even 
It even like went to other cities, I think. Let me see. Oh, it went to LA too. Yeah, yeah. Was it? LAPD. Yeah, here we So yeah, other police departments, you know, same thing. So right, yeah, LAPD, CPD, Chicago. Yeah, what is this? Greece, I guess even. Yeah. So this is kind of like like telling the story by pulling together, you know, all these these tweets and photos. And and this to me was kind of the idea that we wanted to bring what journalists do to social media. Like basically. I see the mission of journalism, in some ways I guess all media, it's just to simply like kind of look at a lot of information and pull out what is actually important to a certain audience and just give you the story of what happens, right? Like this is the context, this is why this is important, this is, you know, what, what you need to know about this issue. Like to me that's, that's sort of the core function of journalism and, and that's all we're doing here. Like you could find these photos on Twitter but you know, a few days later, this stuff is already all gone. It's really impossible to kind of make sense of it. But because you know, this is actually the Times, it's the Times of London is this account which put this together. You know, now we kind of have this thing and can look at it, look at it after the fact. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of you know media companies use this. This is uh, in Canada. People just sharing nice red pay photos. How they're skiing the Tahoe. Nice. Uh, so kind of you know pulling together stories that are just you know collecting social media. So that that's what we we built with Storify, and uh, and so part of you know building this, we we ended up kind of growing our team. Obviously, we had to hire more engineers. We also hired some externalists as well beyond myself to kind of be in charge of community and reach out to users. We would tell stories about how people were using the platform. I mean, there were a lot of ways where these things work together, like, you know, where I think you need both sides of the, the equation here. I mean, again, I think sometimes in the Valley, it's all about the engineering and the product and whatever, but you need distribution. You need somebody talking about, you know, what is going on and reaching out to users. Things don't just magically spread on their own. I think some of the, this, this really is true, like, of all kind of, Platforms. I mean, even something like Instagram. I'm just going to go. Cause they they have an amazing blog actually, where they all the time are kind of telling stories about how people are using Instagram. I mean, of all sorts of yeah, capturing moments in rural Brazil. I mean, they they're constantly kind of you know this is several posts they've just done today. Maybe soothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so like. You kind of need both sides of things. Like you need the there's all sorts of ways. I guess people have talked about this. They say you know I talk about a hack and hacker. There's the hacker and the hustler. I've heard people talk about. There's obviously like the product and marketing. You could call it that. But I mean, kind of being both of these things together for a company to be successful. I think they need to balance each other. You need. I mean, if the person is able to do it all and it's one person, that that's great. But I mean, to some extent, it's almost. It's really hard for the engineer to know, like, to talk to the users and find out what what they think they might build without kind of having their engineering hat on and like already filtering, like, oh, they say they want this, but no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it this other way. Like, I think you really do kind of need to separate these these functions and uh, and figure out a common vocabulary to talk to each other. And yeah, I mean, I found too when I suggest things to my co-founder as a journalist. It doesn't really mean anything unless I have evidence to prove why that is actually like something we should be doing. For example, very early on, I thought it would be really cool to have this feature where you know when somebody is quoted in a story, it'll actually like tweet at them and tell them, "Hey, you're part of this story." You know, like so it'll basically send like at replies on Twitter. I'll just show you what it looks like, so this makes sense. Um, to kind of give people feedback. Uh, most of the time. So it sends these little at replies, you've been quoted in my story. So like people are sending these all the time on Twitter. So I had this idea and I, I mentioned it to my co-founder, like wouldn't that be cool? We should do this. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, we have like a thousand things we need to do. So he kind of blew me off. So what did I do? I actually just like manually, you know, tested it myself. I built like, I just 
created a story, and then I manually like sent all the people like, hey, I just put you in the story, I put you in the story, and found out like, wow, well, like four out of the five people I mentioned like retweeted that or responded or shared it with other people. So I kind of proved to him, I was like, hey, this actually worked. Look, I just did it once and, and people were onto it. So then immediately he built that feature and we had it ready in like a week. So, I mean, I guess it's kind of interesting like this, uh, the way that inside the company, I mean, we kind of, you know, worked together in that way that we really needed to uh, show examples of, of what you were doing and why, why something is important. I mean, like journalists tend to work a lot on anecdotes. I mean, it's kind of like these, there's always a tension between journalists and engineers, like journalists will just talk to three people and if they kind of say the same thing, there you have a trend and I can write a story about it, and great, like we've proven that something is interesting. I mean, that's not really true like data, right, about actually something being a valid, a valid issue. So I think engineers are a little more demanding sometimes and you have to prove like why something makes sense to, uh, to build it and, and have a way to talk about that. I think it really does seem like Anytime we would have this kind of tension between me and my co-founder, if I could show him that I actually did something to build it, like that just earns you so much more, you know, street cred. Whether it's like, you know, I said we really need a WordPress plugin. Great. Okay. He's like, well, I don't have time to build a WordPress plugin. You know, how are you going to do that? So okay, I find an engineer to do it under contract. Do I happen to know? And, and we have a WordPress plugin. Like you, you kind of need to be maybe a little bit scrappier as a non-engineer because you can't always do it yourself. But there is a way to do things, and I think like that from the uh, get, gets you a huge amount of respect from the engineer. Likewise, on the other side, I mean, I think sometimes in the technology world, there's a tendency to devalue content. Like you'll say, yeah, you know, it's to write something like, what is the skill in that? It's just all user-generated content. We'll just throw something out there, and people will magically write like, wonderful, you know, prose and post great photos without any prompting. I think it's kind of interesting that lately we've seen a lot of companies emerge where that's not the case, where it really is like people are valuing high, you know, valued content, like like Facebook kind of now emphasizes links from quality news sources. You know, Twitter is trying to kind of work a lot with media companies and, and put better stuff in their feeds. Uh, you have something like Medium, the blogging platform, which I mean, they actually, you know, excluded regular people from writing and would actually hire, you know, professional writers to write things, kind of see the community and make sure they had really high quality stuff to start. So I think, you know, this kind of like community building and building really high quality stuff is, is more and more important even for social sites, you know, to really have like a solid example of things that you can do. So anyway, um, so we, uh, so we kind of built the product, we, uh, we went to market with this. We didn't have a, a business model initially. We eventually started kind of charging for certain services. And then as Dan mentioned, um, like last year, we were acquired by another company, which is a whole separate adventure, which is kind of, I mean, been interesting to, to look at how we integrate now, like a smaller company and a larger company. I mean, LiveFire is not a, ginormous company, but it feels like it when we only had 10 people at the most. So we've kind of, it's it's like a different set of challenges. They have, we used to be so small that like everybody knows what everybody else is doing, that's fine. When you're in a bigger company, this communication becomes so much more important because now you have giant teams and different departments who handle marketing and product and design and engineering and you know accounting and HR and all these things. So I think more than ever, like the communication part becomes really critical. And you know, we've kind of been learning how to blend into the company. We still like talk as a Storify team in the larger company, but we also are all kind of assigned to different departments and, and working with other people. And so far it's been really, I mean, a great experience. So we've, uh, I think we're learning a lot from each other. Like we kind of had this product that, that got a lot of traction and, and they were interested in taking some of the lessons from that and applying it to their stuff, and, and I'm definitely learning what it's like to be in a larger technology company and the things that go with that. So, anyway, with that, I'm happy to like take questions about any of this stuff, talk about anything relating to journalism or startups or whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. We talked today a bit about uh, teamwork, and I just was wanting to get your perspective, because you mentioned it became a small team. 
So how important was it, that given the small team, to have people that were fully on board with the vision that you had for Storyline? And did you have to let people go who were like, technically excellent, but just didn't fit within the culture of the team? Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, yeah, how to have people on board with the vision, and, and do we have to let people go? I mean, yeah, we, we had, did have to let some people go. I'm not sure if it was about the vision. It was almost more about the culture thing. I think maybe we didn't move quickly enough sometimes to just realize, OK, this isn't working, and we should just not. I mean, if you're in such a small company and one person has like a different attitude and it's disrupted to everybody else, like whether or not they're a genius engineer, I don't think it really matters, or whatever they might be. Like you, you have to kind of move forward and keep going with things. And it's, it's not easy. Like nobody ever likes to do this on either side. And it's really more kind of your mistake for hiring the person in the first place, to be quite honest, I think is a better way to think about it. Um, but yeah, you have to kind of, in a small team especially, like preserve that the culture and make sure people are moving forward because you just don't have time for somebody to like not be fully on board. Everybody has to be doing like, you know, going at it full speed. Yeah. What are some tactics that you used to refine your idea on Storify and how long did that take before you had a, a really good refined idea? Um, I guess it would definitely, well, so we tried this kind of basic version of it, like a really, like it was something that actually my co-founder hacked together in one day. So just to do something super basic, put it out there, and see what people thought about it immediately, not being afraid to put things out there, I guess is the main tactic. And then just a lot of talking to people along the way and, and really like so sharing what we testing. were working on. <laughs> yeah, user testing, I mean, I would just be, I would talk to people who I knew kind of did curation, like cared about this, and even just put a blank piece of paper in front of them and ask them, like, how would you want this to work if you were doing something? Let them draw, like, the user interface. Like, trying to get, you know, super basic, like, not wanting to, you know, poison anybody's ideas at all, but really just, like, getting people to share what they were interested in. And it's not that we built, like, exactly what they wanted necessarily, but it was just good to kind of get the, the feedback. I think being, like, super open to listening and, uh, to what people are telling you. Again, I think that's where like the, the journalism skill set of things actually comes in quite valuable. Like being, you know, knowing how to talk to people and get draw out their stories and then and then condensing that into something you can use is, is really very important. Yeah. Uh -oh. Okay. Sorry. Either one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so you talked about uh, beta users where you try to get your friends to use the website, and there was a point of time when you hit the critical mass uh, where people were themselves developing and themselves writing stories and from network effects take this. So can you talk about the journey from the beta users to the critical mass? How did you target the users? How did you build a community around them? Right. Some strategies around that? I mean we I guess I, I think the key thing with the startup too is like you can't just be like everything to everybody. You really have to have like a key set of people that you're going after like at the start. So for us it was social media editors at news organizations. Like that's the person who would use this. Like so I would just like I knew some of them, so I just started talking to them and really just kind of begged them to try it out. We tried to build in some things into the product that would like show our name. So like when you have, you know, when you go to a, a story where it's part of the platform of Storify is that you can embed it on other websites. So here, I guess, that's interesting. They actually put this in this other tab like this. Okay. I have to subscribe. Paywall. Bummer. Okay. You get that back. <laughs> um, let me, so you, you embed your story on other websites. So we kind of built in like viral mechanics like that. That like, okay, here it is on Globe and Mail in Canada, and there it says Storify, right? So we, we tried to think of ways to like have the product spread itself, and I tried to get like people I know use it that are sort of influential, like the New York Times. I mean, just having them use it once. If people see that, that's great. And all these other news organizations will start wondering, what is that thing, Storify, that's on the New York Times page, or the Washington Post, or CNN, or whoever I could go, like, influential in the space. I mean, I talked to journalism-related blogs that I knew, like Pointer, or, you know, like, Media Post, or Giga Own people. I mean, just trying to go to, like, influential people in this small circle to get them to, like, play around with it, and then, you know, having some kind of mechanism where it, it kind of advertises itself 
and, and also does things like that notify feature. Oh, you've been quoted. Like, okay, we're kind of like spreading it on social networks and getting people to see what it is that way. So, so it's a little bit like the just groundwork. Like literally, like I would go to New York and try to beg for meetings with you know news organization, but also building in some product feature to kind of help it as well. Yeah, you had a question too. Yeah. Oh yeah, was that how you found your first user group after you made that initial prototype in one day? Um, you just went to people you knew who were deeply into this, or how did you find that first user group and how did you elicit feedback from them? That I mean, we actually PR also helped us kind of a lot. I mean, I, I can't underdog you like the getting cover. I mean, the when we did that little embed in one day. Right? We pinged somebody at TechCrunch or some blog, and they ended up writing about it. So that's how good people saw it. Like, I mean, this kind of you can't rely on PR to like make your you know company or product into something, but at least it like gets it out there in front of some people. So I mean, it's definitely been helpful for us because we are a startup that is related to journalism. Because I'm a former journalist, like journalists love to write about other journalists. <coughs> like the media loves to write about media-related things. So I mean, that that's kind of helped us get get attention too. <coughs> and just having like a, an interesting story about the, the company and kind of a vision for what it is helps too. I think it, it took us a while to refine like what, what do we even, what do we do? Like what is this thing called? Like, but kind of repeating it over and over and getting it down just, just helped us you know, figure out how to tell that in a better way. Um, yeah. Do you see yourself ever going back to a role um, as like a traditional journalist or editor? Or um, so yeah, would I ever go back to being a normal journalist? Um, I, I don't know. Sometimes some stories I see and I kind of miss it a little bit. Actually, this this whole thing with the Ukraine and Crimea going on. Since I worked in the former Soviet Union, I speak Russian and I did the master's degree at Stanford in Russian and East European studies. Like this is something I actually really am interested in. I had McFall as my professor back when he was a professor before, and now he's a professor again. Like. That, that topic is really interesting to me and did make me kind of miss being a journalist for the first time, actually in a while. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know, I guess like but what I struggled with as a journalist was that, that feeling like, am I really having an impact? Like, who's reading these stories? And, and through doing Storify, it's pretty amazing that, okay, I wasn't covering the Crimea, but we actually had like thousands of stories about that topic because of the platform that we created. I mean, had really interesting stories, like people tracking down, you know, these non-Russian soldiers, if they're really Russian or not, and, and other people posting on, uh, you know, sites in Europe and all around the world. So I guess, you know, I kind of take more satisfaction maybe now out of having that impact in that way. It, it, it is sometimes frustrating doing the technology thing. It seems a lot slower than journalism, actually. That's another thing I think there's a lot of tension. <coughs> with, like, I mean, news moves very fast. You have to immediately decide. You run. You cover something. You write about it. Whereas, like, software development is really slow. Like, I mean, okay, we can do a prototype in a day of one thing. It's a very basic thing. But to build Storify, I mean, this, this takes months and then testing and debugging and like, does it work in IE8 and all this stuff that like, takes like forever. <laughs> I mean, it feels kind of slow sometimes. So yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think I'm going with the startup thing for now, just because I. I mean, I did one, I had a decent outcome, and maybe I'd like to try it again and see uh, if I can take the lessons I learned and do something better. Yeah. My question is about business model to you. Uh, what is it, and when did you start thinking about it? Did it change over time? How did it fit into the entire experience? Right, right. So we, I mean, we thought about it too late, I would mm -hmm. actually say. I think because we got all this money really early on, we like, okay, we got some nice money from the VC and the bank, we don't need to worry about it. The VC is not pressuring us necessarily to worry about it. I mean, we, we eventually launched kind of a pro plan so you could pay and you can customize things and get extra features and real-time updating and you can collaborate with multiple editors. So we kind of thought of features that were more professional to use, but I think we waited too long to, to think about the business model. I, I think. I mean, this idea that, oh yeah, we'll just make something and it'll be used by 100 million people and then we'll sell it to Facebook. I mean, like that, the reason those stories, like everybody knows about them, is because they are such exceptions. Like, this is not obviously a normal thing. I, I think you have to think about the business model early on. I, I think we should have thought much earlier about it, yeah, from the start. So it would have also put us in a much better position with potential investors to show 
we have revenue, we don't need you guys. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you really have to kind of take that attitude with the investors. Like, do whatever you can to not need them, make them come after you, so then you can dictate the terms you want for, for taking their money. They, they have the privilege of investing in you. Like, you have to think of them that way. Yeah. Um, so what was the impetus uh, to go to Coastal Ventures and like to get money? Um, and then, so like, second question is, what, what, what do you feel was going the best for you when you went into the pitch? Like, what, what brought you? What made you different as a startup? Um, I guess I think we got maybe sucked into this thing, like, oh, to be successful, you raise money. We want to get our tech crunch story where they say we raise funding, like, which is kind of stupid, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it helped to like. It gives you like a stamp of approval and maybe makes people a little more confident to use you, but I, I'm not sure that it necessarily, I mean, really does much more than that. I mean, yeah, we had good timing, I guess it was when people were thinking about like, where is social media headed and how is traditional media going to respond to that? So maybe we fit into this kind of theme of disruption of media, that helped, I mean, Having like a Stanford connection definitely, I think, helped like to raise money since Coastal is also an alumni of the GSB actually, and uh, kind of having, I mean, but really what mostly helped is that we had a prototype and we actually showed people were using it. I, it was actually really great. We went to pitch that morning, it's like super early Monday morning, and uh, you know, been to Coastal first time, you know, you see this guy's billionaire, and he mentioned, oh yeah, it was like the World Series, I was just reading all these funny jokes on Twitter that people were tweeting, and I said, oh, yeah, we have a Storify story about that, and I showed him how, like, a journalist had put together, like, all the funny jokes about, it was like people, you know, rioting in San Francisco or something like that, like, hipster riots, or some kind of weird <laughs> meme that people were talking about, so I showed him that, so it's like, okay, I could show, actually, like, something he just thought off the top of the, his head, like, here was a post about it. And then we went later to the, uh, the partner meeting that day, and I was able to show, oh, by the way, since we met this morning, here's this thing that like PBS NewsHour just did about Putin and his kind of crazy tweets of him, like, you know, whatever, with his shirt off somewhere or something like that. I mean, that, you know, a major news organization just now, you know, use this and, and look at our numbers going up. <coughs> I guess showing the traction was really the most important thing. We tried to like raise money earlier when we didn't really have launch or anything like that, I mean, it didn't get very far because people were like, who are you guys, you know, why do you think you can do this, what's the point? Like, I mean, you know, again, this myth of like, you show somebody a slide deck and they'll give you money, I mean, I don't know who that happens for, I guess if you've had like some huge success in the past, maybe that works, but, uh, but no, I think always like trying to show, just show that this is actually something people are using, the more you can do, I mean, the better off you are. The more you can wait before you meet the investor, the better off you are. Like always just be trying to prove out your product and build a business model as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. So much like the projects we're working on, this startup is really where tech meets content and design. I really appreciate that. Um, can you explain the the environment? Is it is it collaborative? Do you guys have a lot of hybrids or do you have Fuzzy's on one side and Techie's on the other. I'm just curious, like when you guys are working on this, how do you come together and throw it together? As far as team, dy as far as team dynamic is concerned. Okay. I mean, it's not always like beautiful and people getting along, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, it really wasn't like me and my co-co, so it was just two of us. And no, it was just kind of, I think, you know, he respected me that I had like worked for the AP as a reporter and I kind of knew what I, how this process works and how people do stuff. I respected him and thinking about the technology and the back end and architecture and how this should all work. I guess we knew we were able to talk to each other. I, I mean, I, I'm not a coder, but I can read code, I can read API docs. I, can, I mean, I kind of know something at least about the technology and, and he's an engineer, but he actually had media experience and started a magazine when he was a teenager where he crowdsourced articles from students across Belgium, so he actually you know, cared about writing and, and all that too. So, so you guys were both hybrids in a sense. I guess we were both, high, yeah. I mean, I, I think you kind of have to be. Like, there, there's this like, question now, like journalists are wondering if they all need to learn to code, right? I, I don't think coders are worried about learning to write. I think they're doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah. I, I know that journalists all, are all gonna be like awesome coders. Like clearly they are not. Like it's not an easy thing to do. It takes years of practice and learning. But I think you do need to show that you, 
you learn something that you can talk the talk that you understand something. I mean, like I was talking about to get you know a feature I wanted, I had to actually like prototype it and show that it worked. You know, on a basic manual level. So I, I mean, I think you can do that and, and should do that. It's, sometimes it still is my tendency to be like, oh yeah, yeah, build this cool feature, without thinking, well, how can I prove that we need that first? <laughs> um, so, we're, so we're almost out of time. I just wanted to um, um, bring you full circle. So, at Storify, you were one of ten, and at Blackfire, you are one of. Now it's like 140 or so. Okay. So, what's it like to have your uh, baby absorbed into this larger um, um, <laughs> company? And um, what are some of the challenges? With, with that, I mean, as part of the deal, did you insist that it stay, you know, separate? That you, right. you talk a little bit about that, so that so that you, because yeah. often with these with these um, mergers or acquisitions, you know, sometimes they'll just buy you to put you out of business. Right, right. No, I mean, a big part of why we did this is we knew the CEO of the company and. He said we keep the product around and we wanted to keep it around. I mean, it, it has people using it. It's actually more people use it now than did before the acquisition. So the user numbers are going up and we're getting more traffic. I mean, yeah, so we added their little logo here up on the top left. <laughs> but it's not that we, I mean, it's actually kind of working out. We actually incorporated now, like LiveFire started off as a commenting platform and has all the, these, uh, the commenting system and now we've incorporated LiveFire's commenting system because they just launched this cool like annotation comment product which is actually something we wanted to do a long time ago so now we're kind of leveraging the same technology together. I mean it's definitely, sure, it's, it is giving up your baby, I guess I don't own it anymore, I'm part of a larger company but, uh, but you know, I guess I, I hope it's something that can live on, what, you know, as a product and, and something whether or not I'm there. I, I don't know, I guess I'm I suppose I'm not like driven by the, uh, like part of being the mission driven thing is I think if you can create things that actually aren't just tied to you by name, but actually have a life beyond you, have some legacy to them. So I mean, as long as Storefly can live on as a legacy and even just the idea, even it's kind of cool. I see people like do this kind of stuff where they embed media and they say, oh, look at this Storefy story. And it's actually not even a Storefy story, but just the idea of like a multimedia story that kind of includes social media. We've like made that a thing now. So that, that's kind of cool to see even when it's not even us. So, I mean, that, that's kind of what drives me to make an impact in that one. We have time for a last question. Last question. Or, okay, that's what you asked, but you get, yeah. <laughs> So do you think Storyfy would be where it is right now if you didn't have your initial connections in the industry? And second part of that, uh, were you worried going into these meetings that someone would just take the concept and go with their own version of it? Um, I, th I think the connections definitely helped. I mean, I think kind of having some legitimacy as to why we are the ones doing this. Like, I, I think, I mean, I actually was a former journalist, so here I am talking to journalists. It's not like I'm, I'm coming up with this idea because I think, like, yeah, that I can make a lot of money off it or whatever. I, I thought more just like I, this just exists, and I have the you know background in it, and that's why we came up with the idea. So I think that was hugely valuable. I think for any startup, you kind of have to have that story, like why you, why is this your, you know your project, like why does it make sense for you to be the one to do that? I think that, that's kind of a fundamental part about like your pitch. It's like from the start, when you don't have any, you know, giant user base or anything like that, just simply telling the story of why you, you know, started this. And so oftentimes I would put up a picture of me like as a journalist to show like, you know, this is what I was doing at the AP and this is kind of the future of where something like the AP would go. That now, you know, we don't just need, we have reporters in all these cities around the world, but now actually through social media, we have potential reporters everywhere where anybody has a smartphone. And how can we leverage that? So kind of telling that story is hugely important. Okay, so one last question over there. Oh yeah, I was curious about um, user testing and feedback. Um, so as you're collecting feedback, at what point do you realize that you have like 
a representative consensus that would um, inspire you to change something about your product? I don't think it, it's not like you talk to a thousand people or something like that, right? No, I, I think you can pretty quickly see trends of things. I mean, there's still things people say like now, which I wish we would change faster, that we are finally working to change. But, uh, but no, I think it kind of becomes pretty obvious with, with just talking to a few people. Like, I wouldn't kill yourself trying to talk to the whole world for certain things. And, uh, and I do think, it, yeah, this kind of, like I was talking to somebody today, he said, oh, how do you, did you instrument things? Are you using like what analytics tools are you using? Well, like just talking to people is a pretty good tool to like get an idea of what's going on in the app. Like yes, you can instrument things and use all sorts of you know mixed panel and, and different retention tools to figure out all the you know Google Analytics, whatever. There's like tons of stuff that's almost kind of overwhelming like to look at all that stuff. I think you know this kind of basic quantitative talking to people again, doing the reporting, that there can be value in that. Even though, yeah, talking to three people doesn't make a trend story in journalism, but I don't know, three people all kept saying the same thing like product and kind of see something there, like try changing it, see, see where you go. Great. All right, well, let's thank Bert.